Good evening. This is foreclosure and real estate attorney Roy Oppenheim and legal blogger. Uh, I'm glad you could join us tonight for what I think should be a very interesting seminar concerning Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. Um, you know, Elton John, as I grew up, was always one of my favorite uh, musicians. And uh, this song particularly uh, struck me very hard when we were reading in the paper just last week about Fanny and Freddie May. Fanny and Freddie, and how their demise is now rather imminent. And with that, many things that we grew up accustomed to in, in our and about the American dream are in flux and are going to change. And tonight we want to discuss why that's going to happen, how it's going to happen, what it means, and to the extent that you're one of uh, half of uh, the folks in Florida who are literally underwater on their mortgages, how you're going to deal with that, and of course, uh, if you are uh, someone who hasn't owned a home yet, how you possibly could take advantage of that, and if you're one of few uh, professionals, real estate professionals that are still uh, in the business, uh, how you can uh, anticipate what your career is going to look like going forward. So goodbye, Yellow Brick Road, no more Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, a question mark. Our government is a Ponzi scheme. Maybe some of you saw Madoff. Uh, uh, various tapes that are now online that New York Magazine has, has chronicled in connection with his collect phone calls from jail talking to, uh, the, uh, to, to the New York Magazine about uh, what he thinks about our economy and our government and, and how he um, basically was able to pull off one of the larger Ponzi schemes uh, uh, private side. And he's of course suggesting that there are other Ponzi schemes that are much larger and then, of course, the big question uh, which Rolling Stone has been asking is, why isn't Wall Street in jail? I recommend both the New York Magazine article and the Rolling Stone Magazine article if you haven't checked them out, and they're both online also. And you can find them, of course, on our blog at SouthFloridaLawBlog.com. So let's move on. Goodbye 30-year mortgages. Well, we've all be become rather accustomed to the 30-year mortgage. Uh, it is now suggested with the demise and the decline of Fannie and Freddie that the 30-year mortgage will likely no longer be around and that we'll probably end up with 20-year with mortgages. We'll probably also see higher interest rates. We'll also see larger requirements of, of down payments, certainly 10 percent, 20 percent, maybe 25 percent. Uh, and these are things that we can anticipate uh, because if we don't have the government guaranteeing these kinds of loans, the private sector is going to extract a higher premium for all kinds of services. Kind of like the airlines charging you now to bring, roll, bring your, your uh, uh, luggage on, on board. If you're going to check luggage, you have to pay for that. If you want even a drink, you have to pay for that. You want to go to the bathroom soon, you're going to have to pay for that. That's a joke. Uh, and so here we have even rate lock-ins uh, are probably going to be charged for. And so if you're going to have an escrow, that will be charged extra. And, and the bank is going to basically going to really take, take a page out of, out of what the airline industry did and they're going to strip the, the mortgage into, into components and that component part will be charged for each second. I'm not talking about stripping it in terms of investors, I'm talking about charging up front for every component. You want you know, direct deposit or direct payment, they'll charge you for that. Any, anything that they can charge from the mortgage will be charged for. And so what we're going to see is a continual decline of home ownership and that we're going to also see a redefinition of the American dream where we literally can say goodbye not just to the yellow brick road, but we can say goodbye to the picket fence and the pool and the notion that, that the American dream embodies home ownership. And so we're going to see lots of socioeconomic changes as, as this now evolves. And it won't happen overnight, but it is going to happen, and it's happening right now. And we you know, could just see the devastation of, of what happens in a foreclosure uh, driven economy, if we just look at the 60 Minutes piece that was done just this past week, a devastating piece on how we have a remarkable homeless crisis in America, particularly of young children. And uh, to see the reporters brought to tears on, on camera when they asked how many of you have had your electric gone off while you're doing your homework, and to see these children all raise their hands and to ask how many go home and go to sleep hungry at night and to have hunger pangs in America. This is the America that you and I all grew up in is just quite remarkable. We're going to have 25 percent of all children living in poverty in about 12 months according to most demographers. 
That is a figure that we've not had in my lifetime and that we've, had, we've not had in most people's lifetimes unless you go back to the Great Depression. And so this is something that we're all going to have to grapple with as, as we move into this new economy. Foreclosure follies. This is very interesting. The New York Times did an editorial piece on this last Saturday. You can also probably catch that on our blog. They talked about four programs that the government has sponsored, and each one has been a bigger failure than the other. The only one, the only exception, would probably be the FHA short refinance, which uh, has really not taken off uh, and is probably the only program that doesn't clearly have, and, and this is an important word, and we've talked about this for now over two years, issues concerning moral hazard. And that means that when you encourage the wrong people to do the wrong thing, you're going to get more people doing the wrong thing. And so particularly, most of the mortgage uh, refinance programs that the government has had has required you to be in default, has required people to go into default, and only people who were in default were being bailed out and saved. This program, the FHA short refi, was the only program that said, if you've done the right thing, if you paid your mortgage, if you've kept up with all your bills, we will reward you even if you're underwater by providing you a refinance at a lower interest rate. And of course, it would have been even better if they said we'll even, even knock off some of the principal. But regardless, this program has been very slow and all the focus has been up until now in terms of government programs, in terms of helping those people, uh, many of whom, many of whom of course, legitimately had lost their jobs because of, of the, the crisis that was caused by, by Wall Street and, and, and the bankers. Let's take a look at the funds that have been set aside by the government, the Making Home Affordable program. The dark blue is the amount of money that has actually been spent by the government. The light blue, $30 billion, is the amount that's been allocated, and they've spent almost none of it. Same thing with the hardest hit fund. It, it doesn't even fit my finger point, yet there's all these funds, billions and billions of dollars that had been allocated that's not going into these programs. So we basically have programs that, that all had good intentions, yet they all encouraged all kinds of moral hazard activity. The largest servers, especially Bank of America, have, have left most struggling homeowners hanging without either modifying or foreclosing. And we have three colors here, if you can see it. The blue represents loans that have been modified by all the major banks. The pink represents homes that have been foreclosed. And the yellow represents people just hanging in limbo. The blue probably also includes folks who have done short sales, which we're going to be talking extensively about in a little bit. Uh, the pink speaks for itself, and the yellow reflects all those people who are just desperately in, in need of help but have received no, no help to date. Um, total number of homeowners that have applied for government loans, uh, you know, the HAMP loan program, the HAMP loan modification program is, is 2.7 million people. Only approximately 20% have gotten a HAMP modification. That means 80% of the folks have not. We have here showing uh, the numbers, and, and, and they are dismal, um, and they just show that, that these programs are well, well-intentioned, once again, were not thought out by people in the trenches, but rather by, by bureaucrats who are clueless in terms of what's truly going on out, out here. Mortgage servicers are notorious for losing documents, cited missing documents in, in a quarter of all rejections. One of the reasons that people uh, don't end up getting modifications is because the servicers say that they have lost your documents in about 25% of the time. Uh, and if we go down the list, we see all the other excuses. Mortgage does not meet criteria. Mortgage payments are already affordable. They miss the trial payments. Borrower does not need modifications. It goes on and on. But the reality is, the reality is that if you're not in default, if you haven't missed any payments, the banks are just going to end up throwing your, your papers in the garbage. And that's why 25% of them end up being said that their, their documents are missing or that they never received them. Um, and HAMP, the HAMP program hasn't really led much to an increase in modifications. If we take a look at the red at the bottom here, these are the HAMP modifications, and the, the blue are all the non-HAMP modifications. And then we're seeing that the private sector has indeed tried to do a fair amount of modifications without any government stimulus, and we're seeing that the government stimulus has really had a very, very nominal impact on, on, on all modifications, which is just so unfortunate. And what's even more interesting is that while this crisis is continuing to evolve, the number of foreclosures has continued to fall off in, at a dramatic pace. And why has that happened? It's happened because, first of all, there's a new wave of foreclosures that's coming. We have this woman here who's trying to hold back the dike, and she's not going to be successful at it. But we're going to have a whole new wave of foreclosures because since last fall, and of course the banks said that, that, that there would only be a 30 or 60-day 
backlog of foreclosures, and they would continue to ramp up their foreclosures. But all the robo-signing and all the, 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 the fraud that was uncovered through the foreclosure process, law firms that have been uh, really uh, had to close down, shut down, because the government pulled all their business from them, and other lenders have pulled their business from them. Uh, there's been disarray and disorganization in the entire foreclosure process. In 2010, there were 2.9 million foreclosure filings. In 2011, it's projected that there'll be uh, over 3 million filings. Yet, in 2011, there have been so few filings that there will be this, this massive, massive deluge of foreclosures that will eventually uh, hit the market, and, and that has yet to happen again this year. And, of course, there's a backlog also of property that the banks have foreclosed and are now being held back in what is characterized as a shadow inventory. Interesting number of homes that are still uh, underwater, are still growing. Home prices could drop, in fact, another 5 or 10 percent uh, alone here in Florida. The reasons are quite obvious. You have this shadow inventory of, of, of real estate that the, that the banks already own. You have uh, foreclosures that have yet to be filed that will be filed. And, of course, you also have short sales, which, again, we're going to be talking about. Uh, and those are, are becoming very, very popular with the banks. And so those three supplies of new real estate going onto the market will not be met by the demand by either homeowners or by investors. And so depending on how quickly the banks are successful with their foreclosure, and there's going to be a, a real question of how successful they will be, and we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, there could be a, conti a continued dip in, in, in pricing probably through the end of this year into possibly next year. 51% of all homes in Broward are underwater. 44% in Palm Beach County are underwater. I mean, that is a staggering, staggering number now. Uh, and this is also interesting. Uh, you, we all are reading in the headlines that the major banks are, are talking to the government about some sort of global settlement that would provide about $20 billion of new money into, uh, the, um, into the system and allow for um, more modifications and principal reduction to, to occur. Good to see you. Um, but today, Bank of America said that we don't think this is a good idea. We don't think that we should be using this money to reward those homeowners that have stopped paying their mortgages and those homeowners who um, maybe could afford to pay their mortgages and have not been. And so they are suggesting that maybe, maybe they would prefer to help those people who have been paying their mortgages. And so if they think that they're going to get off paying, and by the way, $20 billion is a joke. They, they, each bank should be paying $20 billion. The settlement should be close to $2 trillion, not $20 billion. But having said that, if this money were to be reallocated and used to keep people who are in their homes, who are paying their mortgages, and give them an opportunity to refinance their home, instead of at 5 or 6 or 7% that they're paying now, at 25 3 3.5%, 3 4%, that would be probably a very good use of funds. It, so if Bank of America thinks that this is a way for them to stall or forestall a settlement, I, I think they're, they're very short-sighted. If they're suggesting that helping people uh, to stay in their homes who already are in default is going to encourage other people to also go into default, they may not be mistaken. But they are mistaken if they think that they can somehow get off from having been part of a systemic uh, crisis that they and their colleagues on Wall Street are really, really responsible for. Foreclosure filings in the Tri-County, we can see here, we don't have to spend too much time on it, we're seeing a massive, massive drop-off of foreclosure filings. I mean, it's just a dramatic number. And uh, blue is, is Broward, two is, uh, green or yellow is, is Palm Beach, and, and, and orange is, is, is Miami-Dade, and we're seeing just a a massive decline. Just as we're seeing a ramp up, we're seeing a decline. And we're seeing it kind of lumbering along here since the beginning of the foreclosure crisis, which was in the middle of September right here. And so these numbers will probably maybe not make it back up to where they were in September, but they're going to probably make it back to where they were in, in March of 2010. And so we're going to see a dramatic increase. And let's talk about uh, what that means. Uh, the reduction in foreclosures is an illusion. Banks have a huge backlog of foreclosures. Uh, we'll likely see an increase in the number of foreclosures filed in the next few months, and the banks were slowing down with the filings due to problems with uh, their documents and their law firms. And I want to show you right here a bizarre document that has been filed in the public records in Broward County that we recently came across. Is it any wonder, wonder that David Stern's office is closing, okay? This is a recorded document. It is, uh, 
I believe, an assignment of mortgage. Uh, it was an assignment of mortgage signed supposedly by MERS. And if this were a class, I would ask everyone here, what's wrong with this signature? And the answer is, there is none. I would then ask the class further, what is wrong with the witness lines? Oh, no name, no signature, no printed name, no signature, no printed name. Oh, what state or county? No state, no county. And of course, it is notarized by an individual. But what's wrong with the notary? The notary doesn't have a date, doesn't have a year, it has her stamp, Corrine Valero. If you're out there, Corrine, maybe you could call in and explain how you could notarize such a document like that. Also, if you have a bond, can you give us the bond number so we can make, it, make a claim on your bond? And Colleen, you forgot to fill in the name of the invisible person that actually signed this. Okay, this is just garbage, okay? When you have law firms filing this and you have recorder's office filing this, you got a problem, okay? You got a real problem. No date, no signatures, but it's notarized and recorded, okay? And this document was probably used to foreclose on someone's poor house, okay? This is systemic. This isn't just an aberration. This isn't just like one document that we fished out. This is an example of the crisis. And so what's even more interesting is that these large law firms now have disappeared. All this legal work has gone to 20 other law firms. They all are like little chicken littles because they don't want to sign anything. They don't want to file anything because they're afraid that, that they're going to be the next ones out of business. And what's even more scary is that the bank, excuse me, that the courts relied on the foreclosure money for 90% of the funding of the entire legal system in terms of the, 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 the judicial system this past year. And the legislature says, oh, you got all this money, so we're going to not fund you with any additional money. But that 90% all disappeared because there are no foreclosures. So now when this new foreclosure wave comes, there will be layoffs, there will be people who will be uh, furloughed, there, there will not be enough support in the judicial system to support this new wave of foreclosures. So it, it's going to be very interesting. So we have a make-believe world of robo-signers. The robo-signers were wearing all these different hats, and we have this infamous person named Linda Green. She had different personas, different personalities. Each of her signatures looks completely different. She signed thousands and thousands of, 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 of documents, all in different personas, each one notarized by someone saying that it was the same Linda Green. So this is just a continual systemic crisis that goes on, which is now going to lead to a, a judicial crisis because the, the, the courts will no longer have the funds to, to, to deal with uh, these new foreclosures as they get filed. Uh, can I skip a page? Or? Okay, here we go. Is unemployment up or down? Now, this is very interesting because in order to get out of this crisis, people need to have the resources and funds to pay for their mortgage, whether it's a modified mortgage, whether it's not a modified mortgage. And so we hear that, that unemployment uh, has has gone down, and we'll talk about that in a second, but what we really want to talk about just for a second is, uh, is gas prices, because this is, this is so critical. If gas prices continue to go up, and by the way, gas prices are up 34 cents in the last two weeks, but from our last seminar, they're probably up 40 or 45 percent, 40, 40 or 45 cents. And we said very clearly that for every 2.5 cent increase in gas prices, we lose 25,000 jobs. So just in the last two weeks, we have lost 340,000 jobs, or potential new jobs, and the two weeks before that, we probably lost another 100,000 jobs. So since this last seminar, we have lost probably 450,000 jobs or the creation of 450,000 jobs. So is employment going up or down? It is certainly not going to go up as fast as people suggest because this recovery is going to be really a, a, rare, a rather feeble recovery as it relates to the problems that, that we have in, in states that have been decimated by the, uh, by the real estate crisis. You have places like New York and D.C., those economies are completely different than, than, than the, the organic economies of places like Florida or Nevada or Arizona and even parts of California because in a place like New York, you have, it's an international city. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a city that, that's, that focuses on, on people flying in and flying out from, from economies all over the world. You don't have that really in most of the United States. And so we don't want to, and D.C., of course, has, has just government money. It's just it's just a function of government money that, that, that keeps D.C. alive in the first place and, of course, the surrounding areas. You don't have that in most of the United States. So recent news reports indicate, since the slide I was, I was talking to, that unemployment has gone down, dropping from 9 to 8.9 percent since April uh, of 2009. But the reality is that that number only works because the government is not taking into account all the people that no longer are looking for work. 
if you decide that you are no longer employable, if you decide that you're going to retire, if you decide that you are just unemployable or that you are just so disgusted with the employment market that you withdraw from the employment market, you no longer get included in the figure of someone who's unemployed. So when people withdraw from that, that number, uh, they aren't included. And so that number has continued to increase. And in fact, this 9 to 8.9 is purely a statistical function of people withdrawing from uh, the employment uh, market. Because while there had been new jobs created, you also have new people coming into the job market. And so as, 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 our, uh, as our economy uh, or our population grows, you have to be creating more jobs than the number of people coming into the job market, because otherwise you're just on a treadmill. If you've got more people coming in and you've got new jobs going, you're not helping the people who are unemployed uh, in terms of, of a statistical number. So the reality is that this number is going nowhere and will probably stay stagnant and may ultimately even increase again. So other problems created uh, by the backlog of foreclosures, no funding for the courts. Uh, because of the drop in foreclosure filings had led to an enormous downslide uh, for the courts who have, charged their fund have, have, have ch changed their funding policies as a result of the massive fees they were generating from foreclosure filings. Now with less filings, the court may have to furlough employees, and once that 90% of that funding runs out, uh, there will there'll be an influx of, of new foreclosures, but there won't be the people there to process them. And once this new wave hits, the courts will be ill-equipped to handle the new foreclosures. And so we've kind of created this just bizarre situation that we know these new foreclosures are coming, yet we haven't allowed the infrastructure that the courts originally created to deal with them to remain intact, and therefore this backlog will, will only continue. Now the good thing about the backlog is that if you're going to be in foreclosure and you hire a prominent or well-established foreclosure defense firm, they will be able to assist you in figuring out how best to take advantage of the fact that you will be holding more cards than you previously were because you will be able to use to your advantage and for negotiating purposes and for mediation purposes the fact that you now are challenging the foreclosure. So this is the crux of where we're going. Because the banks know that the foreclosure process has been a dismal failure for them, it has been a massive economic loss for them, on their own they have realized that the short sale has actually been a boon. It's a way for them to create new capital. It's a way for them to reinfuse themselves. It's a way to get their, their borrowers to move on with their lives. Politically, it seems rather of a neutral kind of stance. And at the, at the same time, it has allowed for the real estate market to at least establish uh, some sort of equilibrium where at least we have prices, well, as low as they may be, we're able to establish prices. There was a time in 08 where we couldn't even establish prices because there was no market. There may be sellers, but there were no buyers. And since they weren't coming together, you really couldn't even appraise the value of real estate. And it became, to some extent, for a short period of time, valueless. Now, at least, we have values. They're not high. They may continue to fall another 5 or 10 percent, not 30 or 40 percent, but 5 or 10 percent. And that's because we're seeing this massive increase in short sales and until now decreasing uh, number of foreclosures. And so even when the foreclosures come back, during the foreclosures we find, and, and, and this is one of the things we regularly do, if someone is interested in getting out, trying to avoid a deficiency or a deficiency judgment, the short sale in a middle of a foreclosure uh, defense can be very effective at times. And so what the strategies that we utilize really depends on, on each family situation, but ultimately we're finding the short sale to be very effective. We're finding the banks are in fact uh, moving quicker, we're finding that we're getting less, less hostility, and we're finding that, that the velocity of short sales, at least in our office, has increased probably over 100% in the past 12 months, maybe 150% even. So what is a short sale? I mean, most people know what short sales are, but I just want to make sure that, that we're all kind of on the same page. It allows a homeowner to sell a property for less than what they owe, and it allows a buyer to purchase a property at a significant discount, usually below current market prices. But it is above the cost that someone would pay for that same property six months, nine months, or a year and a half later from an auction at the end of a foreclosure. And typically, the bank will realize 
more money at a short sale done earlier than they will end up with uh, should they uh, proceed to foreclosure. And the problem with the foreclosure is that the quality of the property that's left at the end is usually in dismal shape. Uh, it could be stripped out, it could be vandalized, and of course the bank, if they can't sell it at the sale and they end up with the property, they now become the worst neighbor in America. They don't like paying their homeowner association fees, they don't like maintaining their pools, they really don't like hiring people to, to, to mow their lawns and to keep the bugs out. And many times, properties owned by, by the banks end up being vandalized. They become places uh, where, where gangs choose to congregate, and the banks do not show any spirit of, of true uh, neighborly conduct, as you would expect from someone who truly moves into a home and wants to maintain that home in a, in a traditional fashion. So why are short sales increasing? We just said banks. Uh, make more money off a short sale. Uh, bank problems with documents make short sales more attractive because some of the documentation issues for foreclosures seem to, to disappear when you do a short sale. And uh, banks, of course, get new funds that come in, and those new funds can be used to then make new loans. Other, trend, other trends affecting the short sale mar market. Many of the buyers, many of the buyers in short sales are cash offers. And so they come in low. They're taking money out of the stock market. They've made some good money in the stock market in the past year, and so they come in. Currently, more than 54% of short sales are all cash offers. That is a staggering number, and if it wasn't for these cash guys, if it wasn't for these bottom fishers, we would not have a functioning real estate market today. And so, you know, in our capitalist society, you always have people who take advantage of the situation, and you have these cash buyers who are coming in, and, and they are taking advantage. And I say God bless them, because without them, we would have no market whatsoever. Uh, steal a deal, increase in bargain hunters. I mean, they're just people out there who are, who are bottom fishers. And, and again, you know, it's the American way. New trend shows that people with liquid, liquid assets are reinvesting in real estate by looking for bargains, such as short sales, has even led to some bidding wars. And, and sometimes we do get more than one offer on a short sale today. Now, why should someone do a short sale? If you were underwater, why shouldn't you just walk away? Why shouldn't you just stick your head in the sand? Why should you do a short sale? Or why should you defend your foreclosure? Why should you do anything? And the answer is because we don't want our clients to be subject to a deficiency judgment for the next 20 years in their life. In Florida, as well as uh, probably uh, 32 other states in the union, we, we, we have judgment. We, we're a judgment state as it relates to uh, a being called a recourse state. You have recourse states and non-recourse states. Uh, about a year or two ago, I wrote an editorial called, uh, uh, what do they call it, Tale of Two Cities, I guess, or Tale of Two Nations, and where you basically have certain states where you can get a mortgage, and in that state, if you get a mortgage and you don't pay it, they'll ding your credit, and that's the end of it. In other states, such as Florida and New York, and mainly the East Coast states and, and, and in the Midwest, if you don't pay that mortgage, the bank has the right to come after you for the part that you, you didn't pay after the sale at the foreclosure sale, and they can come after you, like in Florida, for up to 20 years. They can garnish your wages, they can garnish your bank accounts, and they can make your life miserable. And so in order to avoid that, to allow people to get out of this American nightmare that was supposed to be the American dream, our intent is to make sure that we can get our clients out of this crisis without a deficiency judgment. And in almost all cases, I can say that where a client came in from day one, we have not had a client ever faced with a deficiency judgment to the extent that we've been defending their foreclosure from, from the very beginning. So what happens? You have a $200,000 amount owed. You, uh, you, you sold at a short sale the property for $125,000. There's now technically a $75,000 deficiency. Assuming the bank walks away from it, which they typically, typically do today, uh, you end up having a, a $75,000 deficiency wiped. You go on with your life. They don't proceed to come after you and hound you like, you like they would if, in fact, you were foreclosed, did nothing, they got a judgment against you for $75,000, and they then tried to uh, collect on it for the next 20 years. Or they sell it to a hedge fund, or they sell it to a collection agency, and then those folks come after you. And so the whole idea is to put this behind you and move on. And, uh, and again, I, I think that, that's part of the American spirit, is that we, we sometimes have to reinvent ourselves. We sometimes have to accept that we made mistakes, learn from those mistakes, and be a better person the next time around. So, so what we try and do is, is make sure that this does not somehow prevent you from aspiring to do what you want, 
to go where you want, to be who you want to be. And so a lot of our clients come in frowning, and, and it's, it's the, you know, the God's honest truth that, that over time our clients end up smiling a lot more because they just don't feel shackled by, by this obligation haunting them for the next 20 years. So in order to do a short sale or in order to do a modification, one of the most important things is that you need to demonstrate hardship. Now it's very interesting because up until now when you did a short sale, you would have to have a contract and you'd have to fill out a financial application and you'd have to demonstrate your hardship and you'd have to send in a hardship letter and you'd have to do that all at once. And the banks were saying, we don't want to talk to you until you have a contract for sale on your house. And there's one bank in particular that is now exploring, and it's a very large bank, and I won't mention their name just yet, that is exploring giving you pre-approval on a short sale, like in the old days before you went to shop for a house, you would have this little letter that says, I'm pre-approved you know, for a $150,000 mortgage. And you'd go to your realtor, and your realtor would say, wow, we'll take this to the builder. You know, they, they, now they know that you're real, and everyone will, will, will focus on you. And then, of course, you sign the contract, you go to the bank, and the bank would then give you the mortgage for $150,000. So taking a page from that, what the banks are now doing is saying, okay, we're going to certify your hardship up front, and we're going to tell you that we will approve this short sale provided you get us a buyer. Now, what they're not doing yet, and they ought to do, and if you banks are listening to me, I'm telling you right now, you ought to do this, is you ought to certify the letter, not just that the person has hardship, but you should be saying what the minimum dollar amount you want is. Maybe you don't give you a very bottom dollar at that point, but you give a number that's at least within 10%. So they have a goal and an objective, and, and we can come together quicker and faster and get these deals done. The bank thinks that by not telling you what price they want, that they somehow are holding the cards. But what they're really doing is they're making you play this guessing game and you're wasting tremendous resources, bank, when you don't tell people your number. Because in reality, even though you own the house in a short sale, the bank is really the seller of the house. You are the nominal owner and nominal seller, but you have no equity. You're renting the house. Get over it. Face it, okay? You got nothing, okay? So you need the bank's approval and permission to sell the house, and the bank has to give you that number. And so they play this little wily game of not giving you that number, but they should give you that number. So at least we got them going halfway where they're going to give pre-approval, okay? You got pre-approval, so you know you got your hardship. It's been certified, so now you, you get a, a buyer. The buyer comes in. He lowballs the number. You submit it to the bank. We submit it to the bank, and the bank then says, too low. But now the bank has to give you what the number is. Now, if it's really too low, they say, try again. But normally they say, nah, I need another $9,000. Now, that's helpful. So we know we need $9,000. So you go back to the buyer and you say, we need $9,000. You tell the realtors, hey, each can throw in 1000 bucks, whatever. The seller maybe realizes that if they come up with this, the difference, which would maybe now only be another $7,000, the bank is going to let them walk away from a $100,000, $150,000 obligation. People have to realize that if they can improve their balance sheet by $150,000, that's the equivalent of someone giving you $150,000 because now your net worth has just increased by $150,000. And you don't have to worry about a bank coming after you for 20 years for this $150,000. And so we are seeing with no government in in intervention, with no government program, it's taking time, but people are starting to figure out how this is going to work. And so if you are a realtor, and there are a few realtors here this evening, I implore you to continue this process of, of trying to get short sale listings, to try and find buyers who want to buy short sales, and to work with either our firm or any other firm that, that has the expertise in getting short sales closed. I mean, our numbers are staggering. I mean, we are closing probably 80 to 85 percent of our short sales when someone comes in as a, as a seller. We're closing probably 95, if not 98% of any short sale that gets approved by the bank. Once in a while you get a buyer that maybe they lose their job, maybe they get sick, maybe they get divorced, maybe they have to move out of town. But 98% of the, of the time when the bank approves the short sale, we get that short sale closed. And so it's, it's just become, uh, you know, in the old days, just to get a bank to approve your short sale was like a great thing, but we are on average getting probably two or three approvals a day now for our clients. And that's very, very exciting because it's not just exciting that we're getting it done, 
but it's exciting because we know that we are improving these people's lives and the quality of their lives and that they can go on with their life, with their aspirations and their goals and not have this bank haunting them you know, up to 20 years. But let me go back here. I didn't talk about types of hardship, and it's very important. Some people say, well, I don't have hardship. But let me tell you, if we look hard enough, if we figure it out hard enough, we can usually find hardship. Now, there are some people that are so fortunate that don't have hardship, and I say, God bless you. But the reality is everyone has some kind of hardship. And I want to go over this because this is very important to know what you need to know. One is obviously unemployment. Unemployment or underemployment. That's, you know, with the staggering numbers here in Florida, that's not usually that tough. Reduced pay or hours, reduced overtime, that would certainly be hardship. Obviously a death, a disability, a divorce. Some family matter, people moving back in, doubling up, tripling up, taking people in, taking strangers in. Folks in Orlando, if you're taking in some of these homeless folks, I mean, that could create a hardship for you so you could do a short sale. I mean, that kind of stuff is, you know, does create hardship. Um, excessive debt, too much down your credit cards, a home equity loan, a business failure. These are all legitimate hardships. One thing that's not a hardship, and I have to stress this, is simply saying that my house has lost value. And the reason that's not a hardship is that's because that hardship covers everybody. It's a ubiquitous hardship, so we all are facing it. So hardship has to be somewhat unique and distinctive to yourself. If you own other real estate and you had rents in those real estates and those rents have come down, that would be considered hardship because the rents are a form of, of income from a business. And even though the value of that has come down too, your income from that business has now been affected. Anyone in the, in the real estate industry, I think, has hardship, whether you're an architect, whether you're an engineer, whether you're a real estate lawyer, whether you're a title person, a surveyor, a, a, a drywall guy, a, 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 a plumber, an electrician. And that used to represent over 25% of our entire economy. And so to that extent, anyone who's been engaged in those trades and, and professions has seen hardship, including mortgage bankers. Of all people, mortgage bankers. You all got hardship. So do not shy away and say, I don't have hardship, okay? You do have hardship. Mediation. One of the things we, we, we do, especially once we're in the foreclosure context and we're defending, and by the way, you know, foreclosure used to be this dirty little word, you know, and people used to, you know, think it was terrible to be in foreclosure. I think it's the best way to get the bank's attention. You stop making payments. They hire a law firm, you hire a law firm, you get their case dismissed a few times, you get their attention, and then you move to mediation, and you try and have a meaningful conversation with the bank based on what your intentions are. Now, you need to know what your desires are. If your desire is to do a meaningful modification, you get the documents to the bank ahead of time, and then we sit down with a mediator, with the bank, with the bank's attorney, and we actually go through and determine to what extent you can afford and that you're eligible for a modification. If you're looking for a short sale, the same thing. We can meaningfully have a conversation why or why not a short sale is being approved or not approved. Uh, originally, when, when mediations were not court required and was not part of the Supreme Court, we were getting 75, 80% success rate in mediations. But then, when they said everyone's going to have mediations because the success rate was so high, immediately the success rate dropped. And now the success rate in mediations is only about 12%. Question and answers. Hey, we did okay. That was pretty good. Questions, okay. Uh, you want to do, let's, okay. Questions. Good, no, we need Mike, 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 Mike. We're gonna do this right this time. Mr. Waters. Hi, Roy, uh, great presentation. Uh, it's it's uh, very exciting, actually. Um, now, how are banks expediting the uh, the short sale process? I mean, are they slowing things down or do they wanna actually speed that up, right? I, I kind of alluded to that a little bit, but, but the banks are starting to really uh, try and figure out how to push this process along. And, and one thing they're, they're doing, as I said, is we're going, we're, we're seeing the banks actually uh, pre-approve people for a short sale by certifying their hardship. And uh, I want to thank you for uh, supporting our website all these years. Uh, this is uh, sure. uh, Mr. Waters from, uh, from Webcast One, Rick, Rick Waters. Uh, hi, Roy. Uh, what can I do if a bank breaks into my property? This is a great question. You'd say, you know, breaks into my property. Why would a, a bank break into my property? Well, I'll tell you today what happened. We had a staff meeting, and we get a call from a frantic client, and they say, there's a locksmith here changing my locks. Now, I think we have a motion to dismiss pending. There may be a foreclosure pending, but there's certainly been no sale, and the bank's not even close to having any legal right to this property. 
So what we did was the client called the police, the police showed up, and they told the guy if he continues to stay on the property, he will be arrested. Now, he was an agent of the banks. Now, why do the banks do this? They do this because sometimes they're afraid that the property has been abandoned, sometimes they, they, they show up at the wrong house, and sometimes they think they're in the wrong state. Because in some states, they, there is self-help remedies available, but in states like Florida and New York, you don't have those remedies. And so you can't go on to someone's property, you have no right to touch their property until you have a writ of possession or you have title to the property that's given to you uh, by the court after a foreclosure sale, after the 10 days has expired, and after the clerk has actually issued the deed to you, which is usually on average around two to three months after the sale of the foreclosure. And so when they do this, they are committing all kinds of trespass. They're probably committing crimes. They're certainly committing uh, unfair and deceptive trade practices. And uh, what you need to do is uh, either call me or call the police or do both. Hmm. Okay, we have a question from one of our online users. A Florida realty broker told me she could negotiate a short sale of my property without me having to stop making payments and no deficiency judgment. Is that really possible? Because I have rheumatoid arthritis, live in a two-story house that I'm struggling to maintain. Do I need to get a doctor's memo to validate this hardship? Okay, let's work backwards. If a realtor is telling you that they can do anything concerning deficiencies or deficiency judgments, unfortunately they are practicing law without yeah. a license and they've committed a crime. <laughs> yes. That's number one. Number two, the average realtor, including some of my best friends and family members, uh, only are required in the state of Florida to have an education of, of, a, of a high school degree. Now I have lawyer friends who are realtors and so uh, you know, when you get advice from someone like that, that would be one thing. But if you're just getting advice from an average realtor, you need to be very cautious that that kind of advice could, could be expensive because it's free, and you know what happens when you get something for free. Uh, in terms of not being in default, we have not seen any short sales in our office where someone has not missed at least one payment. And if you go back to hardship, it's somewhat of what we would call a tautology, like a, like a mirror reflection. If you're not missing payments, then what kind of hardship do you really have? What kind of hardship are you reflecting back? If you're missing payments, the theory would be, you're missing payments because you have hardship, and therefore that helps certify and prove and justify that hardship. My recommendation would be is to find someone to represent you in the short sale. Go ahead. Well, this, this question from one of our listeners makes a whole lot of sense. They are behind. It says, what do I do if I am behind on my payments, but my bank hasn't filed a foreclosure against me? So you are behind, yes. and the bank hasn't filed a foreclosure yet. Well, you have uh, three choices. Do nothing, wait till they file the foreclosure and hire a, a foreclosure defense firm, number one. Number two, you may want to do a modification if that's in fact what you want to do and you want to want to stay in the home. And number three, you may want to do a short sale. And so those are your only three possible options. Wait till they come to you or go to them and look for either a modification or short sale. But before you do any of those things, you have to decide what your desire is, what your intent is, what you, you want to, to do with your life. Okay. Yeah, Roy, uh, I have a friend who uh, settled a short sale last year, so their home they did a short sale successfully, but now you bring up this deficiency judgment. How do you find out whether or not there will be a deficiency deficiency judgment at some point in the future? I mean, how do we know? Is, is there, if a short sale goes through, does that mean the great, quickly great question. that okay. there's no deficiency judgment? Rick is asking, how do you know uh, you're not going to be hit with a deficiency if you do a short sale? And the answer is that hopefully... Uh, you have read the short sale documents, you've had a title company read the short sale documents, and you've had someone, preferably a lawyer, negotiating the, the deficiency. I mean, that is the main, the main function of a short sale is not to get the realtors paid a commission at the short sale. Okay, that's not the function of the short sale. The function of the short sale should be focused and it should be very, very simple. And that is for you to walk away scot-free. Okay, that, that's, that's the, the, the goal. Now, Sometimes you don't walk away scot-free. Sometimes you walk away with a negotiated settlement. And that negotiated settlement could be that you're going to pay $5,000 at closing. 
or that you maybe aren't going to pay $5,000 in closing, but you're going to pay $10,000 in $250 increments over the next X number of months and years. And so if it says nothing, it means that the bank can, if they want, later on sell the paper and come after you if they so choose to, or turn it over to a collection agency who can hound you. And if they do that, they'll have to file suit and then turn it into a deficiency judgment. Because right now, your friend, is, if, if, it's, if it says nothing, which it probably does, he is subject to a deficiency. That deficiency could become a judgment if, in fact, someone files suit. Uh, a collection agencies, a hedge fund that buys the paper, or the bank if they decide to keep it. Normally the banks don't keep it. They will send it off. And so when they send it out, they could send it to a law firm that's a collection agency. They make a few phone calls. They don't do anything. And they get sued. And so now, all of a sudden, you're back in the, back in the oven. However, if that becomes the premise upon which you will decide not to do the short sale if you don't get a good deal, you still hold the cards to say, well, that's unacceptable. Then, you know, foreclose on me. Screw you. I'll fight it. And so you then are able to negotiate and get a decent deal. And let me tell you the numbers in all fairness, okay? Where people, in fact, have some resources, and even though they have hardship, they may have some resources, they will typically pay anywhere between 12 cents to 20 cents on the dollar that they owe. So that means if you owed $100,000 in a deficiency, in a short sale, Instead of having to write a check like in the old days for $100,000, which people used to do. I mean, people have to understand that. In the old days, when you were upside down on a closing, you would show up with a check, and you'd write the check, and that'd be the end of it. Okay, that's not today. So instead of writing a check for $100,000, you could be on the hook for anywhere between twelve dollars and $20,000. That twelve, dollars maybe you write a check and say, I'll write you a check for ten right now and call it a day, and the bank will say fine. Or you would agree to pay them maybe up to $20,000 over a period of ten years with maybe zero interest or one or two percent interest, some nominal amount. And then there are strategies for negotiating that $20,000 down again a year or two from now. And so it ain't over until the fat lady sinks. But people need to know that even if you have resources, okay, you still can do a short sale, but be realistic that you may have to contribute something. And there may be nothing wrong with that, okay? There may be nothing wrong with that. But you still can benefit from the short sale, even if you have resources uh, that could be available to apply to, to the short sale. Thank you. Um, another question. Um, is it to my benefit, if I'm in the process of doing a short sale, to accept a cash offer rather than um, an offer based on financing? Okay, that's a great question. And, and we did indicate that over 50% of all short sales right now are cash offers. And the reason for that is there's a tremendous benefit. What happens is if you interpose another bank, that means if you are the buyer, you know, you have to deal with the seller and the seller's bank. The seller's bank, of course, is calling all the shots and is holding all the cards. But now if you, the buyer, have this other bank, that bank is now going to call all the shots too. And they're going to want an appraisal, and they're going to want to see how many loans they have in this community. If it's a condo, they're going to want to make sure that they don't have too many loans in this building. And all of a sudden, you get all these other factors and problems that you now have to deal with when you are looking at financing from a bank in a short sale. So as a seller, if I'm representing you, and there are two, two deals, one is a short sale by a cash offer, and it's a few thousand dollars less than, the, than, than an offer by someone who is getting 75 or 80% financing, we will recommend to first try the cash offer. You know, I have a question um, as a home buyer. You know, a lot of short sales are out there. There's so many great deals, and I've been following your blog and just all the different news that are going on this week. I mean, what do I need to protect myself as a buyer if I'm going to buy a short sale? If you're going to be a buyer buying a short sale, um, Besides having a good realtor, of course, you would also want to have a good real estate attorney uh, representing you to make sure that when you buy the property that there are no liens on the property, that all the liens are taken care of, uh, that you've done your proper inspections, that you don't have mold issues, that you're not in a cancer cluster, mm -hmm. that you're not uh, going to be dealing with Chinese drywall. Um, I mean, these are all the kinds of things that you need to be well aware of and advised about uh, when you buy any kind of real estate today, but particularly uh, a short sale. You're typically going to be buying it as is, 
which means you have to do good inspections. You need right. to understand that that means that if something breaks after you close, you, you can't typically hold the seller responsible. And even if you can, if they're doing a short sale, they probably don't have the resources anyway to help you out, even if uh, there was a non-disclosure or some issue. Um, so you really want to make sure that your homework is done properly. Okay, great, thank you. Good question. Um, another question, what about homeowners association fees? Is it better to stop cease payment on those if you can't afford it or, I mean? You know, it's, uh, that, that's a great question. And uh, the homeowner associations keep going back to the legislature for more and more power to try and figure out how to deal with the problem of, of, of folks who aren't paying. And there's a bill pending right now that says that if you don't pay your bills, they can take away your cable, they can take away your internet, they, they're already taking away your clickers at the gate, and they're going to treat you like a guest and not a homeowner yourself, and they were going to try and do whatever they possibly can to make your life as miserable as possible while you live there. And so what we also have found is that the homeowner the lawyers who represent the homeowners are a lot more diligent. They typically do much better legal work and are able to foreclose on you a lot faster than the banks. And so we typically recommend that it is not a neighborly thing to do to not pay your homeowners. And thus, we suggest that it's unfair for you to straddle your neighbors with your burdens. <laughs> and also, uh, they can act very aggressively to make your life miserable. And so in the context of, of foreclosure defense, we typically advise people that not paying your homeowners is not a good idea. So um, how about, is there, a, is there a right to a speedy trial issue when the bank files against me and then uh, takes three plus years uh, to come to court with their proof? The answer is no, absolutely not. <laughs> there, there, it, the, the, uh, you know, if I, I could give you a 10 second constitutional law issue here, but the bottom line is speedy trials me, uh, is a requirement because a lot of people can't make bail they're sitting in jail, and they're sitting in jail for a crime they may not have committed. And so now their life and liberty, or certainly their liberty rights, have been completely taken away from them while they're sitting in jail. And so the idea of what's called speedy trial, speedy trial act, have to do with fundamental constitutional rights. And that constitutional right is that you have a right to go to, to trial and, and, and try and prove your innocence within a very quick period of time so you're not incarcerated for an extended period of time without, without having been adjudicated as someone who has committed a crime and is found guilty. Uh, this is civil, we're dealing with civil situations here. And why would a homeowner want to have a speedy foreclosure? I mean, I mean it, 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 if anything, it would be the banks that would think that they should have a right to a speedy foreclosure. But the irony is the banks, in their way to the courthouse, shot themselves in the foot, shot themselves in the head, chopped their hands off, and lost their marbles. And so, uh, the irony is, is that had the banks done their foreclosures properly, had they not encouraged fraud, had they not participated in fraud, had they not done all the things that, that congressional reports have clearly indicated that they have done, uh, they could in fact have a speedy trial. But it is only because they could not get out of their own way that there is no speedy trial for a bank. You, you just mentioned about the HOA fees. How about my insurance coverage? If if you know my house has gone down from two hundred to, good lord, hundred or one hundred and twenty-five, can I can I change the coverage right. of the that, insurance? That's a brilliant question. I I, I I think it's a wonderful question. And the question is, you know, are not are not most people over insuring their homes? That's the question. And the answer is that a lot of people are insuring them for what the bank says you have to insure them. But if in fact the value of the homes have fallen below that. I am suggesting tonight that that may be a crime for the insurance industry to require and the banks require for you to insure your home for a value that does not exist. Mm -hmm. Over insurance is illegal. And I know the insurance companies like that excess premium, but the great irony is if there was a hurricane and if your house used to be worth $300,000 and now it's worth one hundred and fifty and you insured that house for $300,000, how much is the bank going, how much is the insurance company going to pay you when there's a loss? You've insured it for 300, the house is worth 150. Anyone want to guess? What are they going to pay you? How much are they going to pay you? 
Thank you, 150, okay? So you paid all that excess premium, right? For something that does not exist. And tomorrow, I ask all of you who are insuring your homes to call your insurance companies and tell them you want to reduce the value of your home to its assessed value. And if they say you need an appraisal, you can probably get a pencil appraisal from a realtor. If necessary, we can give you the phone number of appraisers who can probably do this for two or three hundred bucks. And by the way, you're not supposed to insure the land value either, because land does not disappear. So the formula is replacement value minus land. And guess what, folks? That's going to be less than your mortgage every single time. Final words, nice words, and thank you. Isn't that nice? OK. My final <laughs> words are, I want to thank you all once again for joining us and for making a, a what we do not just a, 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 a profession, but a, but a passion. And it's something that uh, you know, I truly uh, I relish. It's something that I, I take very seriously. And it's because of uh, the folks out there and the folks in the studio tonight that have made us as successful as we are. And it is a deep honor and a pleasure to uh, to, to serve all of you. And so I want to thank you and thank my assistant Jackie for helping uh, uh, put this together for us. Thank you very much and have a good evening. <laughs>